pro, I kind of want to talk about uh, coaching development. I call it evolution of a personal trainer. And this is really a, a conversation I have with our interns and our young staff uh, frequently throughout the year about how to develop yourself long term and, and find a way to a successful career. So um, really looking forward to touching all these with, with both of you. So uh, my book, Functional Train Anatomy, an An Anatomical Guide to Training, um, just came out through uh, Human Kinetics a couple weeks ago here. And my co-author, Mary-Kate Fight, who, uh, God bless her, took my writing and made it uh, understandable and legible uh, and organized for everyone else to understand, because without her, uh, this would never came about. Um, so I knew, because I kind of need an adult in the room to put this together. Uh, but if you're interested in my talk today, uh, the book is a much longer version of, of what I'm going to touch on here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I saw some familiar names in the, uh, in the attendee list there, but some I didn't know. My name's Kevin Carr. I'm a strength and conditioning coach and licensed massage therapist here at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. I'm live from the office here right now. Uh, I've been here since 2008. I'm also a massage therapist and I operate Movement as Medicine uh, massage therapy that I started with Brendan uh, way back in about 2013. I'm right next door here uh, where we work with people kind of helping them get back from uh, injury and chronic stiffness and immobility and get them back to training. And along with that, owning and operating strengthcoach.com, Body by Well Online is now MBSC TV. I have to update that um, and CFSC. And so um, if you're interested in anything I talk about here today, you probably look into those resources for more. So kind of going back to the beginning, uh, when did I first hear the term functional training? When, when, where was my eyes opened up to the term functional training? And we have to go all the way back to probably 2006, 2007. Um, I was working at a Gold's Gym in Maynard, Massachusetts, not necessarily the Mecca uh, for functional training when you think of that. It was a small little Gold's Gym, lots of meatheads, and I was working at the front desk mainly uh, like any other 19 year old guy. So I could work out for free and talk to chicks. So it was a really good gig. Um, and, and that's like any guy that age, I was, you know, just, I'd flipped through the muscle and fitness that week and, you know, whatever, you know, the Tom Platt's quad workout or the flex wheeler, you know, back workout, that was like what I was doing. Right. So lots of volume on the pec deck or the leg press or the hack squat, whatever it was, uh, just to try to get as jacked as possible with really no idea what I was doing. I did know at the time, though, that I did want to go to school for kinesiology. I didn't know what path I was going to go, whether it was physical therapy or strength conditioning. Um, and so I, I was on the right path. I, I thought, you know, I'm going to start training. And I, I've been going there for a little while. And the one day I met this guy who was a private contractor at Gold's. His name was Clark Evans. And I'll always you know, give him a shout out because I wouldn't be sitting right here at Mike Bull Strength and Conditioning if it weren't for him. Because I remember looking out across the gym one day. This guy looked athletic. He was probably, thinking back, he's probably the same age I am now. He's probably in his mid 30s, early 30s. And he's doing single leg squats and he's doing single leg deadlifts and uh, he's doing like body saws. And he's doing all the stuff that I've never done pretty much. And I'm like, wow, this guy is really good. So he invited me to work out with him and it crushed me completely. I could barely, I couldn't do a single leg squat. I could barely do a split squat. Um, and I remember being like, thinking like, that was awesome, but that was really hard. It was unlike anything I'd done before. And he said, you know, if you're into this, you should really look into uh, working at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning or look into a mentorship or an internship. He had just done a mentorship there. And um, that's when my life changed. Uh, I got an internship here and it opened my eyes to a whole nother world of looking at program design and looking at coaching for fitness, uh, not just sports performance, um, in a way that I'd never seen before. And for me, when I started here, when I first came in in 2008 as an intern, I, my life changed and I saw it, I found like, this is what I want to do. And I want to, when I give this book to people, when I give this presentation to people, try to open my eyes, open those people's eyes the same way that kind of Clark did when he pointed me in the right direction to come to MBSC, because that Mike really is kind of the, the godfather behind this kind of thinking and approach to coaching. And I'm trying to just continue to carry that torch along with Brendan and along with um, Chris and Todd and some of these other people here at uh, Mike Bullshit and Conditioning. So functional training is kind of a hot button term, right? Uh, if you put that out on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, you'll probably get some responses, some positive, some negative. Because I think when you say functional training, the first thing a lot of people's heads go to is like this woman on the right uh, squatting on the BOSU ball or people wrapped up in bands or doing 
like twisty cable exercises um, and saying that it's functional, right? And, and that's usually what people scoff at and laugh at, especially the heavier lifting crowd, the traditional power lifters and the bodybuilders. Um, if you ask that crowd, like the traditional strength training crowd, the bodybuilders, the power lifters, they'll tell you that back squat's functional, right? They'll say that, that gets me to my end activity, that gets me to where I need to be. And maybe if I talk to the people in this crowd or probably the contemporaries that I'm used to being around, they might say that split squat in the middle is functional. And, and what I want people to understand with uh, when they hear this is functional training doesn't mean you're selecting a one certain exercise. What functional training means is that it's purposeful training. It means that it's thoughtful. You, you, it's a thoughtful exercise selection process. You're picking exercises with care um, to try to enhance the outcome for the client. We're not just throwing stuff up on the wall and seeing what sticks. We're not doing what I used to do, which was just open up muscle fitness and choose what looked the coolest uh, from the most jacked guy on the page. So if I was going to define functional training means we're purposefully selecting exercises to improve a specific outcome. And we're basing those selections on the structure and function of the human body. So what is functional by definition is going to mean what has the most carryover to that client's activity, to those people that are coming in to train with you. Um, and, and with the body that they're bringing in, what is the best tool that we can choose if, with respect to their body to get them to that outcome? So that means your answer can be variable, right? So if we go back to some of those examples, like I showed earlier, like the girl on the BOSU ball, a lot of us would look at this and scoff and say, well, you're not going to see that at MBSC, or you're not going to see that at Beyond Strength. And, and you're, you're likely 100% correct in that, uh, that that's probably not going to carry over to the people that we're working with. But I mean, maybe if you're working with a circus performer, you could say that that skill acquisition is functional. Now, that's going to be a really small percentage of the population, probably 0% of the people that come in here are going to need to uh, use, uh, need the use of a BOSU ball to work on balancing to help them get better at their profession or, or whatever their end goal is. But it's important to keep an open mind when we think about what is purposeful when it comes to exercise selection. The same could be said for the power lifter, right? I mean, I know we're pretty popular in MBSC because Mike has been pretty outspoken uh, in regards to us not programming things uh, like back squats or heavy barbell work um, and spinal loading, mainly because it doesn't have a carryover to our clientele, uh, young competitive athletes and general population clients. But if you're training for powerlifting, this would be a pretty wise choice. I don't think you could actually train for powerlifting uh, at the highest level and not back squat uh, because that is very specifically the end goal activity. So I think that would be functional training for them. But the chances are, if you're listening to this presentation, you're spending your time with us this weekend, that your population looks like probably these three uh, that are here with us. Um, if you go all the way to the left here, uh, the young man balancing uh, the stick across the shoulders, like a beginning athlete, like our, our middle school kids uh, or some of our brand new athletes who've never been here before, there's probably someone who has a really low training age. Uh, someone who hasn't trained very much before, so they have to learn the fundamentals. Or maybe you're working with a competitive athlete, like the young man in the middle, who's a college baseball player that I work with. Um, or maybe all the way on the far side of the screen, uh, this is Sharon and Jim. These are some of my longtime group and personal training clients who are uh, in their 60s and 70s and come their diehards three or four days a week. Maybe you work uh, with a population like that. The chances are, I think, if you're working in a privatized setting uh, as a personal trainer or a sports performance coach, your population looks a lot more like this and a lot less like uh, the previous two examples, like the power lifter or uh, that lady on the BOSU ball. And so with that in mind, our exercise selection should respect that um, and, and take those things into account. Um, and, and we can't necessarily carry over the things that we like or the things that uh, we we see on uh, social media to necessarily the clients that we're working with on a daily basis. And, and the, what's interesting is when you think and these are like mainly our population, um, but they're probably doing a fairly similar program, despite if it's a beginning athlete, a more advanced athlete or general pop, there just might be variations in um, intensity and volume. Uh, and I always go back to this quote from Jorge Carival, which is uh, your sport is not different. You just think it is. Um, the fact of the matter is the majority of the people that work with us, that specific intended outcome that the, our functional training choices are for is pretty general. And that's okay. Um, general population clients, low training age clients and team sport athletes, that specific outcome is gonna have a lot of overlap. You think 80-20 rule. 
Um, the basics win. Uh, another uh, Dan John reference going off what Chris said is, you know, being brilliant at the basics. Um, we're all working with the same body to get towards fairly similar outcomes, albeit probably at similar at different volumes and intensities. So if you take one of our middle school programs, if you take our adult program, if you take our athlete program, there's going to be much more in similar, uh, much more similarities than there are differences. We might be some slight differences in exercise selections like sprinting and hand cleans with the athletes where we might not do that with the adults, but they're all going to split squat. They're all going to do push-ups. They're all going to dumbbell bench. They're all going to row. They're all going to push. They're all going to pull um, and do anti-core work, just at different part, parts on the spectrum. And, and so to me, in our setting and probably your setting, that's what functional training looks like to us. Right. So those generalities, those general goals that I talked about here, um, that 80, 20, when we think about it, if we look at the red here, 80 percent of the people that walk in the door for you, uh, your their training selection, their exercise selection is going to be dictated by these things, things that make them feel better, things that improve their general movement quality, things that increase their power, strength and speed, um, enhance their cardio, uh, cardiovascular fitness and lose fat or improve body composition. A very minor group of people to come into you are going to require adaptations to for things like balance training, strength or mobility at really extreme ranges of motion, working around ab, uh, anatomical abnormalities, or really unique rehab situations or high levels of bilateral strength. Those are, I could think on one hand, the amount of times I actually have to really think about those things in our setting, um, as opposed to uh, the eighty percent here shown on the other side, left side of the screen in the red. Right, and so our general approach, our recipe is gonna be uh, fairly similar. Oh, the phone's ringing in the office here. Um, so that means every time we're gonna start with mobility training, uh, we're gonna start to prime the ranges of motion that they have. I gotta hang this up. Um, go through an active warm up and develop movement skills, um, like for both adults and for kids. You know, we are, we are thinking about the general qualities of warm up. We're looking to increase tissue temperature, wake up their central nervous system and start to develop basic movement skills. Can they go forwards? Can they go backwards? Can they go sideways? Can they go rotate? Both for adults and for kids. Um, like I said, maybe at different intensities. If I have my older couple, uh, Stu and Nancy, I always refer to, they're 79 years old. We do a ladder drill. We do backward shuffle. We do sideways shuffle. We're just going slow. When I'm with my athletes, we kind of just crank that speed up a bit, but recipe remains the same. General power and speed work, jumping hurdles, throwing med balls, sprinting with the athletes. And then our core selection will look like push, pull, hip dom, knee dom, um, and core based exercise. Um, and then some sort of uh, general aerobic and anaerobic conditioning work at the end uh, with our athletes. It might tailor a little bit more towards the energy demands of their sport. Uh, with the adults, we're probably just going to continue to hammer uh, their aerobic system as long as possible to ensure a long term cardiovascular health. Um, so a rest, uh, quote I always got from Mike that I really always refer back to is functional training is a recipe, not a menu. It should be a comprehensive approach. It's not just about getting them strong. It's not just about getting them powerful. It's not just about doing conditioning and it's not just about doing mobility. It's about all of those things and the cumulative effect of them consistently getting exposure to those things over the long haul, right? Um, an athlete who is strong but lacks mobility is at risk for muscle strains, and joint damage, uh, a client who is extremely mobile but isn't strong uh, in a sporting environment uh, could be overpowered by their opponents. If it's a gen pop client, is at risk for disuse and uh, an inability to, to do functional uh, activities of daily living as they get older. Um, an athlete who's powerful but lacks conditioning would won't be able to maintain power output over the course of a competition or over the course of a season. So you, you don't want any one trick ponies. And that's true for life as well as in sports. We're looking to build well-rounded general qualities. Um, and that's why I always dissuade the idea of like sports specific training and that like as strength conditioning coaches, we're here to try to enhance all of the quality so they can take those into their sport um, and then take them into more down a more narrow path by working with their skill coach and practicing their sport. Um, and that's really what we do as strength coaches. We're masters of generalities and getting people fit. Um, and that's also why this stuff translates so well to general population clientele. So if we've kind of defined functional uh, training, how can we define what is functional anatomy? What differentiates that from uh, what we would call gross anatomy or basic anatomy? And, and how is that going to change how we look at selecting exercises? Right. 
Um, and I think sometimes when we talk about functional anatomy, you hear people say like, oh, that this gross anatomy isn't useful. And that's actually not true at all. Gross anatomy, the stuff you learn very early on um, in your uh, training experience, uh, in like if you're going through school, through a bachelor's program, um, it is really, really important. Um, that's where you learn structure. That's where you learn origins and insertions of muscles. That's where you learn about pination and angles uh, of tissues. That's where you learn about innervation, articulation, positions of size of muscles relative to one another. And you probably saw a chart that looked a lot like this. So that's where you start to learn the fundamentals. Um, but to understand how that's going to carry over to how people move, you have to start to learn exercise and you have to learn how muscles work in certain positions. So to me, functional anatomy takes the ideas from gross anatomy, the, the basic understanding of um, origins and insertions and positions, and it puts all that together, um, taking into account the action of the muscle, the planes of motion that we move through, as well as how positions dictate function during certain exercises and how gravity has an impact on how we move. So to me, it kind of takes all of these things, actions, planes, and positions, and brings it into living, moving anatomy, not just dead anatomy on a table, but uh, moving through space and sports or in life. So um, fundamentally, you have to learn, you know, what a muscle is doing during different activities and how it affects, uh, how that's going to affect why we select certain exercises and how it's going to carry over to their sport. So understanding during running, what muscles are working concentrically during mid stance, what muscles are working eccentrically, isometrically, what are working as agonists, agonists or stabilizers or synergists, all that stuff, the major head spin probably early when you were learning anatomy is important as is a lot of things. Uh, the stuff you probably slept through in anatomy class actually has a really big carryover uh, to how you do your day-to-day -day, uh, job now in ex selecting exercises and programming and coaching. Um, planes, understanding planes of motion, what muscles do work in the sagittal plane, what muscles work in the frontal plane, what muscles work in the, the transverse plane. Um, so we can understand how our exercise selection most translates effectively to sport. And then finally, when I say positions, how do length tension relationships change to affect how muscles work, right? So for instance, in the single leg squat, if we go back to talking about agonists, antagonists, stabilizers, and synergists, what happens during the goal activity? When Joe, who was the model for the single leg squat photo um, in the book, uh, did this. So when he's doing that single leg squat, we know the agonist, the main working muscle during the activity is the quadricep, right? Um, so if you're thinking about doing a knee re rehabilitation, like I was just doing literally right before I came on this call, um, the number one thing we want to focus with this young lady was developing the ability to concentrically uh, develop force or quadriceps. So, I mean, single leg squat's been a steady diet of what we've been doing. Meanwhile, understanding that um, the antagonist, the muscle that's creating the opposing force is the hamstring. Um, and how is that going to affect uh, our mobility choices um, in, in programming, how's that going to affect um, our exercise selection and strengthening her hamstring as well, eccentrically, um, so that she has better control of her knee going through flexion and extension. So we were literally doing a pairing where we were doing uh, single leg squats, and then we were doing eccentric slide board leg curls to try to work on developing control of knee flexion extension in a closed chain situation. So literally was just doing this before this. Um, and then also understanding in how, what are the stabilizer muscles that are working to help her do that exercise effectively? Um, stabilizing muscles, things like the adductor magnus and glute medius that helps translate, uh, help stabilize the femur and hip in the frontal plane and the uh, transverse plane uh, while she does that exercise through the sagittal plane. Um, and then also the glute max is an assistance exercise. So being able to take these exercises and break them down to make better, more effective choices, especially in a rehab situation like I just referenced. Um, and, and understanding, like I said here, I mean, kind of a little bit redundant that the shortening muscle and the lengthening muscle in what muscles don't actually change typically uh, your synergists. Moving into uh, planes of movement, this is something that always confused me when I was a kid or when I was kind of learning anatomy, it was like, which is which, right? Um, I'm understanding that like, when we're thinking about functional training, having carry over to sports and carry over to life, we're not just living in the sagittal plane. When you go back and you think about um, traditional bodybuilding and powerlifting approaches, they're going to be very sagittal plane heavy because the ultimate goal is to produce as much force in a singular plane of motion 
uh, or to create develop as much hypertrophy as possible. So we're going to have as we they're going to want as little variability as possible to get the outcome that they want. Correct. So for them, for functional training, if you're trying to be a bodybuilder, a better choice would be one that is sagittal plane heavy because there's less variability in movement. It's easier to do high amounts of volume and high amounts of load with less variability. Same thing for powerlifting, right? The more force you can produce in one single sagittal plane, the better carryover you're going to get for ultimate maximal strength. The problem is that that probably doesn't carry over well to a competitive athlete or a general population clientele who has to live their life dynamically. Um, like Chris said, their theme um, in their story of their gym is that people want to not ever have to question, can they do, can they go on like a run with their kids? Can they go on a hike? Can they go play uh, tennis or, or recreational soccer and think that they're not going to get hurt? And so I think to be able to answer yes to that, we want to include exercises that stimulate the athlete in multiple planes of motion, not just flexion and extension, but in adduction and abduction and rotation and pronation and supination, things that challenge them in multiple planes. So having an understanding of what muscles are working in different planes during different exercises is going to help us program more effectively. And then finally, something that people don't think of quite as often is how do positions and orientations dictate muscle function? Uh, muscles are just a slave to the positions our bodies are in. And when muscles are overly shortened or overly lengthened, they're not in the ideal positions of leverage to work, right? Um, so in this example, this is a real simple one of uh, what we call like an open scissors posture with an anterior tilt of the pelvis and an elevated rib cage, not inherently bad in and of itself, but it just sets up muscles to be more or less effective depending on the positions that we're in. So if we're extended like this, a hamstring is being eccentrically loaded, it's being overly stretched, not a really great position to be strong in, right? Um, if you think about if we did a bicep curl really simply, you, it's usually going to be the, the hardest at the bottom because it's really hard to create leverage from a lengthened position, right? Um, that said, also on the other side with the abdominals, if someone's in a really extended position, it's really hard to get them to use their abdominal muscles. So when we're coaching exercises and cueing them or programming them, we want to choose exercises that take these things into account. Um, so that muscle that our programming can be more effective and our clients get better carryover uh, to their end goal activity. So coaching positions. Um, and we're going to go over these things in a practical sense in just a minute here. Just to go back to the idea of, of planes of motion, one thing to keep in mind um, when you look at some of the exercises we're going to reference here is that there is a difference between global planar movement and local planar forces or local stability forces, right? So Nick, uh, one of our former coaches here doing a rear foot elevated split squat in this picture, if you watched him do that split squat up and down, you might say he's just moving in the sagittal plane. He's just going up and down uh, or a little bit forwards and backwards. Um, there's not a lot of visible frontal or transplant first plane motion. He's not going side to side and he's not rotating. But it's important to realize when you do things on one leg, they become inherently multiplanar. Right, because if he were to do that split squat and he wasn't going to square his hips up and focus on keeping himself uh, stacked nice and tall over his hips, he would start to side bend or he would start to rotate due to a lack of stability. And if you've ever taught a beginner how to do a split squat, you can see pretty clearly where they lack stability in those other planes. So what's happening with those stabilizers is they're working um, isometrically and eccentrically to keep his pelvis stable, to keep his femur stable um, while he's moving predominantly through a sagittal plane, he's still getting stability development in multiple planes uh, while doing that exercise. And so when you're selecting exercises, especially the value of doing things unilaterally, is important to remember that you develop uh, eccentric and isometric stability um, just by simply by doing that exercise correctly in the sagittal plane in the first place. And kind of going straight off that, it's because we're designed as to live our life unilaterally. Uh, we pretty much live our life one leg at a time. There's really only one sport that is bilateral in nature and it's rowing. Um, everything else is going to be unilaterally dominant. Your life is going to be unilaterally dominant. Um, and so we've been evolved. We've evolved over time to function that way. And you can see we, when you look at these like anterior and posterior oblique systems shown here, is that our muscles have developed pination and angles in a uh, rotational fashion where our left glute connects to our right lat our obliques connect to our adductors to help us move in these contralateral patterns. So when we select our exercises, we want to try to have the greatest amount of carryover to sport and the greatest amount of carryover to everyday life. We want to take these things into consideration um, with 
the selection of our exercises. So getting into the practical piece of this a little bit more, the question I questions I want to ask when we're building a program and we're sitting in MBSC and we're thinking, uh, how do we build a program for the summer, which is what we're going through now. We want to ask ourselves these questions. Am I loading the appropriate tissues? Am I loading the appropriate joint positions? Am I addressing the specific planes and actions? And can I load it at the volume and speed intensity that I want? Right. I think if you're trying to uh, audit your program and say, should I put these exercises in, especially for athletes? These are the four questions I want to ask. And then on top of that, you could say the fifth one might be, is it fun and do they enjoy it, especially when it comes to general population? Um, so I think as we go through, we can kind of go through this practical uh, experiment right now, and we're going to continue to ask these questions as we go through. So how can we make better programming choices uh, when we're building a sports performance program or a general population program? So let's start with some lower body examples here. And we're going to start with hamstring strains because this is typically a really popular topic, especially in sports performance. Um, and it's something that I think we have a unique view on here at Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning. And it's something that I don't think we actually see a lot of here at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. So I think that we're fairly successful at dealing with them. Um, it is the most like common soft tissue injury in all of sports. Um, so probably something we should keep in mind. So what does the hamstring do? Why don't we just start by saying from a functional anatomy standpoint, what actions do the hamstring do? And if I were to ask most people, especially in like a freshman level anatomy class, the first thing they would say is the hamstring concentrically flexes the knee. And right now as I'm sitting down in the chair, it does do that, right? I can concentrically flex the knee, but what really matters to us is what does the hamstring do when we run? Because that's when hamstring strains occur. People don't get hamstring strains sitting down in a desk, at least hopefully. Um, so while we're running, while we're in gait, the hamstring actually works to concentrically assist in hip extension along with the glute. It eccentrically decelerates knee extension. So as you see uh, that guy in the picture there about to have a foot strike down on the ground, the hamstring is working over time to eccentrically slow down the leg tibia from swinging forward. And it isometrically helps control positioning of the pelvis. Those are the three main jobs when they actually research and look at um, hamstring function that is actually going on. Um, when the heel comes up towards the butt, that's actually majority of that action uh, when you're running and that knee flexes actually comes from segmental aerodynamics from the leg swinging through as opposed to the hamstring actively flexing it upwards. And then, so if we know what the hamstring does, what do we know about hamstring strains? So if you look at the hamstring group here, you have three of them. You got the semimembranous, semitendinous, and then the biceps femoris, and you got a long head and a short head there. And the biceps femoris is most commonly injured of, of the, three, the three hamstring muscles or the, or the two heads. It's the long head of the biceps femoris as opposed to the short head that is commonly torn uh, or injured. It's commonly almost, almost always entirely happens during the terminal swing phase of gait. So right like you see here with this guy's picture as his foot's about to strike or in this little image on the screen here, it's in number one and number seven, right around just before heel contact or just at heel contact is usually when that hamstring blows up. It's not in toe off, it's not when it's rapidly coming backwards, it's when it's just about to hit the ground or just hitting the ground. And that reason is because there's a high eccentric load. Your, your body's doing hamstrings working overtime to try to slow that leg from coming forward. At the same time, it's isometrically trying to keep your pelvis from tilting and trying to maintain a tall pelvic position. Um, and it's just about to rapidly concentrically help assist uh, hip extension. So I always say like, if I showed up to teach a CFSC course and they're supposed to be Brendan uh, and Steve Bigelow and myself, and I show up and I got 30 people for the course and it's just me, those two guys were out drinking the night before and they didn't show up. I'd be really pissed and tired by the end of the day because I had to do the job of Brendan and Steve. And that's typically what happens with someone's hamstring. It's like there's two guys sleeping on the job. And so the hamstring ends up filling in for a glute that doesn't extend well um, and it ends up uh, substituting for obliques that can't control the hip well. Um, and all of a sudden it's working overtime. Um, so we want to think about developing the hamstring to help do those jobs, to help extend the hip, to help maintain the position of the pelvis, while also strengthening um, those two other muscles, the glute and the obliques, to, to take a little load off the hamstring. So that's typically what we see um, is and why you see a hamstring blow up during that specific phase. Um, we know when you they do a bunch of they did a study, they looked at a bunch of athletes over the course of a season and they studied a bunch of different uh measures as far as 
um, hip flexion, anterior tilt, uh, and, and muscle activity. And when they, they looked at that, athletes that had hamstring strains, they found the ones that had hamstring strains frequently presented with increased hip flexion angle and or increased anterior tilt uh, when compared to ones that didn't. They found they had presented with more medial tibial rotation. So if you think about where a hamstring attaches uh, at the medial uh, condyle of the knee, it would increase uh, medial knee rotation if there was high levels of eccentric tension in that hamstring. And uh, the hamstring was weaker when compared to the glute on the same side. So there wasn't a lot of strength in that hamstring uh, that had been injured or, or was injured later on in the season. Um, so again, kind of looking back at the day that we looked at here is it, the, the hamstring is typically the scapegoat for all the other things that aren't going well in poor positioning and poor posture. Um, going back to this example, like I said before, an eccentrically loaded hamstring, someone who's in an open scissors posture, um, is in a poor position to contract and produce force. Same with the abdominals on the other side, because you're constantly putting those hamstrings under stretch. Um, concentrically loaded hip flexors and paraspinals will typically present with increased tone. So those, there's that increased hip flexion angle and that increased anterior tilt uh, that the researchers saw when looking at the data of athletes who had suffered hamstring strains throughout the season. Um, so here we're going to see Brandon doing some leg curls. So kind of going into thinking about exercise selection, realize not all leg curls are created equal. So a lot of people would say, well, if you want to rehab a hamstring, hop on the leg curl machine there and start just developing some strength in there. But like I said, you have to think of all the things that the hamstring does, right? So we said the hamstring is actually not really a primary knee flexor, like done in the, the leg curl there. It's an eccentric knee extender. As you see, Brendan slowly extending his knees here. It helps maintain pelvic positioning. So good uh, pairing between the rib cage and pelvis, not in that open scissors posture. So if you see Brendan bridge up here, he's got good tension in his abdominals. He's not sticking his belly out. He's not overextended. Um, and it's also also works as a hip extender. And you see he's in good hip extension using his glutes and using his hamstrings. So I want to be able to check those boxes um, as far as muscle activities, positions, um, and loads. So it carries over greater uh, to preventing hamstring strains in the future, whether that's with a competitive athlete or one of your general population clients who just tweaked their hamstring out on like a 5K uh, or a recreational run. Um, and so that's why I think these exercises have such greater carryover uh, to preventing or reducing the likeliness of hamstring strains in our athletes. Additionally, including things like single leg deadlift, which also uh, would use the hamstring to assist hip extension uh, along with the glutes. You can load it heavily at checking that box. Can I load it at the volume or intensity that I want? And then finally, the last box I had to check in those questions was, can I load at the speed and velocity? And I think the final piece to most hamstring strains is high speed running. That's something we're gonna do every single day with our athletes, um, mainly because I heard someone, you know, vaccines are obviously a hot topic right now. Uh, someone say hamstring strength sprinting is uh, kind of like a vaccine, hamstring uh, sprinting is like a, a vaccine for hamstring strains. Uh, one, it's very specific to the task, it is the task. Um, it's very hard to prepare someone for the high velocity nature of sprinting if they don't sprint. Um, so all of our athletes are going to run time sprints like, like I just had the kid Dimitri there run there. Um, so that way, when they have to sprint on the field of play, they've already been exposed to that high level uh, of speed. What I do find is a lot of people who have hamstring strains typically uh, jog uh, or do slower sprint, slower running during their preparation time. And then when they get out to the field of play, that's actually the fastest they ever run. That's not what we want. We want them to reach the highest velocities when they're with us in the gym. So that way, when they're out on the field of play, they're over-prepared for what they're about to do, right? So going back through those questions, am I loading the appropriate tissues, the hamstrings and the glutes and the oblique specifically? Yes, if you're doing a leg curl, you're getting all of those things at once, as well as these other exercises, uh, bridging and single leg deadlift and sprinting. Am I loading the appropriate positions? Definitely in uh, the sprinting and single leg deadlift example, those, are, if you look at the single leg deadlift in the top right, and you look at the sprinting below, those are almost identical uh, hip and joint positions, minus the fact that her torso is a little forward. Uh, am I addressing the planes and actions that I want? Yes. Uh, like I said, I eccentric, uh, eccentric extension of the knee, uh, concentric extension of the hip, as well as isometric position of the pelvis. And then can I load at the volume, speed, and intensity I want? 
Um, and all of these exercises allow high levels of loading and sprinting allows the specific speed that what I want. So again, again, it just goes to selecting exercises that have greater carryover to the end goal activity. Sticking with the lower body for another example, um, one thing that's obviously a hot button topic with MBSC is single leg training. This is something Mike has uh, pushed for a really long time. Um, and it's one of those things that when he first said it, uh, a lot of people got really angry. I uh, can't believe you don't back squat. Um, but I think as time has gone on, we've seen more and more people that kind of adapt to this uh, approach. And the question is, you know, why do we always train on one leg? And I think if you look at human anatomy and you look at how people move in life and you look at sports, the answer should be staring you right back in the face. We are designed that way. Um, it, we weren't designed to do things bilaterally. We can, um, but every sport is done on one leg and moving through your daily life, you're very rarely pushing equally with two legs at a time unless you're getting straight up out of a chair uh, or off the toilet. Other than that, it's pretty much a unilateral game. Um, and so we want to take that into account, especially if we want to improve sports performance. Um, anything that you do in sports is going to require multi-planar musculature, frontal plane musculature, transverse plane musculature. Um, so we want to start to prepare the athlete for that when they're in the weight room with us and when they're uh, you know, preparing themselves uh, for the sport. So remember, like I said, sagittal traditional training approaches are going to be primarily sagittal and bilateral, and that's not inherently bad. Uh, bilateral exercise is really valuable in teaching fundamentals and basic strength for gen pop and for athletes. It's much easier to learn an uh, exercise in a balanced position. Um, and you're typically going to be, it's going to be better for people who are weak or coming off an injury uh, because they have the benefit of using two legs, right? Um, so we goblet squat in our program. We bilateral deadlift everybody that comes in here. So I'm not saying that we don't do those things or we shouldn't do those things. Uh, but as we get further down the road of training, we probably want to um, start to specify more into things that have greater levels of carryover, right? Um, obviously, unilateral exercises um, are going to be harder from a strength standpoint for a lot of people to learn as initially. So we might want to be slow uh, introducing the beginners, uh, but there's going to be stimulation of frontal plane and transverse plane musculature if we're going to do them correctly. For Jamie to do that perfect looking single leg squat, his adductors and glute need have to work overtime to keep him centered with his pelvis over his femur. Um, and this is going to just have higher levels of carryover to a dynamic environment in life or in sports. Uh, added benefit, all of this is just typically going to be a lot less spinal loading. You can typically load adequately with chest loads or hand loads. You don't need to put a back load on someone uh, to be harder because they're going one leg at a time. They probably require less external load to be added to the system. Uh, like I said, the global movement still in the sagittal plane, but for case in here to be doing that single leg squat or uh, Richie to be doing this split squat correctly, he's got to be squared up over that. He's got to be using those um, frontal and transverse plane muscles more effectively um, to get that carryover that we want. Um, it was interesting, Alex Natera spoke at our winter seminar and he's done some pretty amazing research on single leg training. Um, and what he found is um, that a 50% body weight skater squat, like an external load, um, or 50% body weight, like traditional single leg squat, like almost like a pistol squat to a box, um, is equal to two, uh, two times body weight bilateral squat, right? So, uh, for example, like I'm 220 pounds. If I did a single leg squat with 110 pounds of external load and vests, that would be the equivalent of doing a 440 pound, pound back squat. Um, and so if we can get the same type of force production and the same type of, uh, stress, on the joints without as much actual compressive external load, that's a win. Because for athletes or adults, if we're looking to have them compete at a high level all year round or feel good all year round, we don't want them to feel like shit from training. Um, we want them to have less uh, external forces upon them so that we can get better performance and better day-to-day -day living with less risk and compressive forces on the spine. So um, for us, that's a win. Uh, and, and so, that, that's always want to look for. And I think it's important to realize lots of times in bilateral exercises, the point of failure isn't the legs, it's the spine. You never see someone fail a back squat with their chest up high. You see them fail a back squat with their chest falling forward, typically because uh, their, their torso isn't strong enough to take the load, not necessarily because their legs can't push it. Um, and I think it would be a remiss to say, to not talk about single leg pyelometrics when we talk about training on one leg. Um, because I think if you want to talk about carryover to sports, that's probably the most um, important thing that we do. In fact, 
so much so that when we just had to cut down our program because of COVID, uh, we had to cut down, cut out exercises. We had to cut down the program from 90 minutes to an hour. We only had about 12 minutes for speed and plyo. If you can think about like minimum effective dose. So we pulled out all the bilateral plyos, mainly because something had to go and single leg plyometrics are non-negotiable. Uh, so we weren't doing box jump. We weren't doing two leg hurdle jumps uh, because ultimately I think if you can one leg hop high, you can probably two leg jump uh, pretty just as fine. Uh, I don't think it works the other way around. So um, if we're trying to think about reducing lower body injuries, things like ACL injuries, things like ankle sprains, um, I don't think there's a more valuable tool with this than single leg hops. We get deceleratory eccentric control. We get high rate of force production, high speed contraction. And then ultimately we can start to work towards elasticity uh, by having them um, rapidly hop and land over hurdles like Craig is doing in, in the slide here. So again, if we want to think single leg training as it relates to sports performance and injury prevention, the four questions again, am I loading the appropriate tissues uh, from the primary uh, standpoint? Yes, glutes, hamstrings, and quads. Secondary, our frontal and transverse plane muscles. Yes, things like adductors, glutes, and obliques. Uh, am I loading the appropriate training positions, single stance and hip flexion as it relates to sports? That's pretty much the position we're in a lot of times if we're going to produce sports when we're running, sprinting, and jumping. Am I addressing the specific planes and actions? Uh, yeah, in the sagittal plane, I'm uh, you know, developing uh, rapid force production through the glutes and hamstrings um, and stability uh, focused training in the frontal transverse plane. And then can I load the volume, speed, intensity that I want? High potential loading relative to body weight. Like I said, 50% of body weight external load. We're getting a lot of our athletes up to that in single leg uh, movements, both skaters and uh, single leg squats, and then single leg plyos allow us to check that box for speed of movement that we want. Getting into the trunk, uh, I'm choosing to say the word trunk instead of core training. One, I think core training is a buzzword, but I try to think of everything from the neck all the way to the pelvis as developing trunk strength as opposed to just core strength when we just think about, uh, you know, the visible abdominals. So, you know, what should core training look like? If we're thinking about developing core strength, what are the exercise selections that we want to make? Um, and like I said, I don't think it's just the visible abdominals. People always think rectus, rectus abdominis. You think transverse abdominis, internal, external obliques, um, as well as the stuff you can't see, the multifidus, the diaphragm, the pelvic floor, transverse abdominis. But then I think we always forget the stuff that's on the backside. Uh, we always think like there's no muscles like, you don't just think about training the front of our arms. We think about training the back of our arms. We don't just think about training the front of our legs. We think about training the back of our legs. But the lats, the serratus, the erector spinae, that's all part of trunk musculature as well. And I think if you're doing effective core training, all that stuff should be uh, in the mix as well. So what do core muscles do? I think if you look at traditional approaches to training, everyone would say, hey, you just flex the trunk. And maybe that's why we're so overly focused on the anterior portion. Um, but in reality, when it comes to sports and it comes to life, they brace and buttress against outside forces. When that guy goes to get that rebound uh, in that picture there, it's helping him reach and stabilize and get as long as he can, which is a huge demand on the anterior core musculature. So if you think about a chin-up, that's actually probably where there's the highest amount of core function. And you're not getting any motion at your spine typically when you do a chin-up, but it's helping to brace your pelvis and your rib cage together. They work as isometric and eccentric controllers of trunk motion, more so than dynamic creators of trunk motion. It's not to say they don't do that, but they tend to control positions and control torque as opposed to actually actively producing it at all times. Going back to this uh, image that you're probably sick of by now, but joint positions dictate muscle function. Again, overly lengthened and short positions aren't ideal positions of leverage. So typically when we're teaching people core exercise, we want to teach them how to have better uh, pairing and better um, relationship between their rib cage and their pelvis. So to try to fight against that open scissors posture, uh, like shown here. So for that reason, most of our exercises, or actually all of our core exercises are going to be what we call anti, uh, core exercise. They're anti-extension, anti-rotation, anti-flexion. So, um, if you see Joe, uh, doing the ball rollout at the top there, he's resisting falling into extension. There's a high amount of stress on uh, his rectus abdominis, his internal external obliques, and his transverse abdominis to keep that position despite the increasing force trying to break him into extension. Same thing with Ariel on the bottom right doing a uh, inline chop, trying to maintain position of her rib cage and pelvis, although there is a uh, force coming across her in the uh, in the frontal plane 
And in the transverse plane, she's trying to resist that force. And that's what's going to carry over to someone like that hitting a tennis ball most effectively because you're able to maintain stiffness through the midsection and deliver force into that ball as opposed to you know breaking into extension or breaking into rotation. So like I said, our main focus when we're developing core exercise or developing programs is um, the first thing we think about is developing sagittal plane competency. Can they keep their rib cage and pelvis facing one another? Can they get a good relationship between their rib cage and pelvis? Um, and that's going to allow them to have better control in all the other planes in the frontal plane, in the transverse plane um, from there. So how are we going to do that? We start with anti-extension exercises, sagittal plane exercises, primarily things like planks, things like rollouts um, to maintain that link tension relationship so they can have a nice stack position there. And then we'll move towards these multiplanar approaches, things like a pal off press, things like chops and lifts, um, things like suitcase carries that are going to start to affect the body outside of the transverse plane. The sagittal plane um, is going to be the foundation because if you're not in a good position relative to one another, these muscles aren't going to work well to begin with. So we start there and then build that relationship outwards from there. So specifically as it relates to sports, you know, what happens to the spine during rotational sports? How can we prepare the athlete uh, from a core training standpoint or a trunk training standpoint for rotational sports? Because I think often this is a what you see on social media when you see functional training, things like twisty cable exercises or, uh, you know, Russian twists and stuff like that. Um, but I think we can take a more thoughtful approach to that if we think about what actually goes on uh, during rotational sports. And in reality, every sport is a rotational sport. Um, if you look at uh, Mike Tyson here or the guy swinging the baseball bat, high amounts of uh, rotational force during these things. But what you might notice is there is an actual lot of rotation at the spine. If you look at Mike Tyson on the top right there, uh, you see his shoulders and his rib, his pelvis are actually moving together. You don't see his, tw his tor upper torso twisted away from his lower torso. Same thing with the guy swinging the baseball bat. You see it's the line in his pants and you see his shoulder lined up. Everything's rotating together. In, in truth, when people are doing rotational activities, there's very small amounts of disassociation between the upper trunk and the hips during rotational activities. So things where you're rapidly twisting back and forth probably don't actually have a lot of carryover because what's happening is we're controlling force transfer from the leg to the hands um, in where there's heavy impulse forces with very small amounts of actual spinal rotation. I think oh, lots of times when people think about preparing athletes for rotational sports, they think there has to be a lot of rotation uh, between the trunk and uh, between the hips. And that's actually not true. Um, so, I mean, if you look at Tiger here, um, you can actually see he gets some thoracic rotation at the top, but if you see his lumbar, you see his rib cage um, and you see his hips, they're going to come down at the point of impact together and they're going to follow through together. If you look at the end of his swing there um, and, and what they actually find when they look at professional golfers is the, the ones that hit the ball the furthest, the ones that actually tend to be the healthiest, um, have strong coupling of hip and lumbar rotation together. And they find that golf golfers um, with limited hip rotation exhibit high levels of lumbar rotation during swing. And those are the ones that typically are at higher risk for back injuries because they have to make up for the fact that their hips don't rotate well by increasing lumbar rotation in their spine, causing them compensatory movements and typically leading them to a higher risk of injury. Um, and that's why the ability to maintain hip rotation by doing things like mobility work is, is so valuable. Um, this is a really good example um, of disassociation in the thoracic spine. I found this video because you can really see the amount his thoracic spine moves, but you can, if you go back and look at his lumbar spine and his hips, they actually move together and he just gets a lot of side bending and rotation through his upper spine. So again, showing why things like the joint by joint are so valuable. If you go back to the joint by joint approach and you think thoracic mobility on top of core stability on top of hip mobility, um, why that is such a valuable concept is that for him to do this rotational activity successfully, he needs to exhibit high levels of all of those activities. He needs to be able to maintain his core stability while rapidly rotating uh, through his hips and his thoracic spine and keeping the core uh, together to link those two pieces um, together to be able to put his force into the ball. Um, I gotta plug my computer and I just realized it's about to die. Um, so that's why we probably don't necessarily choose exercises like this because they're just not gonna have as much carryover where it's gonna be very rotational heavy 
um, we're typically going to instead choose exercises that are going to focus on anti-rotation and anti-extension, uh, just because there's going to be higher levels of carryover to our end range activities, and we're going to put our athletes at less uh, risk for injury in the weight room to begin with. So what we'll focus on is first developing sagittal plane strength in the trunk, then developing trans transverse and frontal plane strength in the trunk, and then transverse and frontal plane power. So moving from uh, slower, uh, high levels of strength activities to things that are going to rapidly produce more force. So again, like Joe demonstrated in the book, seeing things like anti-extension exercise, where I'm really focusing on positioning my rib cage and pelvis on top of one another to static exercises like a side plank where I'm trying to control forces, not just in the sagittal plane, keeping my rib cage and pelvis on top of one another, but also controlling um, in the frontal plane so that I don't side bend. And then to things where I'm actively producing, oops, where I'm actively uh, producing rotation but not moving, right? So I'm actively pushing that stick into the wall as hard as I possibly can, but not moving. So I'm creating rotational torque, but I'm resisting the ability to move. I'm trying to actively create rotation without putting rotation through the spine. And then things where I'm resisting rotation, like a pal off press, press or an anti-rotation press here. And this is a real throwback because you can see I have a, a lineup and no hair here. Uh, <laughs> but things like a push pull exercise where I'm resisting torque and trying to maintain that relationship between my rib cage and my pelvis. Similar to the chop and lift exercise as well. And like lots of times you see chop and lifts where they're really lumbar rotation heavy. As you can see, uh, Lisa here doing it. She's getting thoracic and cervical rotation. But if you look at her, like from her rib cage down, she's staying nice and stacked. Uh, between a rib cage and pelvis. And that's where you're getting that multi uh, planar core training effect um, and strength as opposed to, you know, having it be an active rotation exercise. It's an anti-rotation and anti-extension exercise. And then from there, taking that into the sporting activities. And this is why we do things like throw med balls. You build a nice foundation of general strength by doing these core exercises um, and these, these strength training exercises, but then to ultimately carry over and bring transfer in their sport, doing things where they're going to do high levels of um, uh, rate of force development to carry it over their sport that are going to uh, focus on developing hip rotation, and thoracic rotation. So again, here, as you see him throwing the med ball, you don't see a lot of rotation through the lumbar spine. You see him rapidly rotating through his hips into his shoulders to put that ball into the wall. Um, so kind of as I get to the end here, um, that doesn't mean you can't do all these other things that you like. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not telling you you need to do all these functional exercises. It doesn't mean you can't do single joint exercises like curls uh, or back squats. It doesn't mean that isolated and bilateral exercises are bad. Recognize that everything you do in the weight room is on a spectrum of specificity and carry over to goal activities, right? So when you're thinking about programming for those people that come into your gym, again, I go back to like what Chris said, you want these people to think, I don't have any doubt that I can go out and you know, play, you know, pick up basketball or go play with my kids or, you know, go hike a mountain. You want to do things that are going to help support that activity. That doesn't mean curls are taken away from that, but the program needs to have more, uh, more steak and less sizzle. So you want to think about selecting exercises that have greater amounts of carryover. Um, and it's okay to do things that you like, like squats and curls and these other things, as long as you're doing also the other things that you need. Um, I know Brendan says this a lot in coaching rules is ultimately it all depends right? Uh, it all depends what that athlete's and that client's goal is. And that's what's going to de demand that you select certain exercises one way uh, or the other. So when you go through it all, again, when I program, I always try to ask myself these questions. Am I loading the appropriate tissues? Am I loading the appropriate joint positions? Am I addressing the specific planes and actions? And can I load at the volume, intensity, and speed that I want to, to try to get that person closer to whatever the goal, the goal is that they're working towards. And if you can check those boxes, I think you're building a program that is functional in the sense that I mean it. And that means that it's purposeful and you're selecting these exercises thoughtfully to get these people to where they want to go, right? Um, that's how you guys can contact me if you need to send me an email. Uh, that's my email address, coachkimacar at gmail.com. That's social media at Movement is Medicine. If you want to 